Hey everyone, we're so excited to gather for worship today. Our church is all about joining God's mission, transforming all things, and we believe that starts in our gatherings. God is here and just might speak to us and transform us. So during today's service, we'll sing to God and hear a teaching from the Bible. Then. Hey everyone, we're so excited to gather for worship today. Our church is all about joining God's mission, transforming all things. And we believe that starts in our gatherings. God is here and just might speak to us and transform us. So during today's service, we'll sing to God and hear a teaching from the Bible. Then we'll spend a few moments in quiet reflection and take time to respond to God before we dismiss. We'll be together just over an hour and you can follow our order of service to know what's coming next. Let me show you how. Grab your phone and go to votrweekly.org. It's the best way to stay up to date on everything at the Vineyard. In addition to the order of service, you'll find song titles, announcements, sermon notes, and next steps. If you're new here, we'd love to connect with you. While you're on votrweekly.org, click Next Steps and use the quick form to introduce yourself. Or grab a card from the back of a chair, fill it out, and drop it in an offering box. We'll follow up this week to start a conversation. This summer, we're hosting small groups that gather around shared hobbies and common interests. Groups meet in June and July and are the perfect place to build friendships with people in our church and throughout our city. Check out all the options and find your group today at votrweekly.org. Ladies, let's have brunch on the lawn. We'll gather this Saturday, June 4th at 9.30 a.m. to worship together, create space to get to know each other more, and have fun. RSVP at votrweekly.org. Hey, kids and parents. Join us for Summer Splash right after church next Sunday, June 5th. We're celebrating the end of the school year and kids moving up to the next grade. We'll have pizza, water games, and a brief ceremony. Check out the details at votrweekly.org. All the ministry of our church is funded by the generosity of people joining God's mission, transforming all things. And we're amazed at how God uses our donations to transform our hearts and to transform the world. Instead of passing offering baskets, we have boxes in the back of the sanctuary where you can place your gift. You can also give online. Just tap the giving link at votrweekly.org and follow the prompts. Service is starting in just a few seconds, and we can't wait to worship with you. Whether you're on the live stream or you're in the sanctuary right now, we want to invite you to stand as you're able and lift your voice as we sing to God. Good morning, everyone. My name is Natalie, and uh, this is Mia and Matt, and we're going to be leading you with the team in worship this morning. I want to invite you to stand with us. And as we get started... Before we sing, I'm going to read from the scriptures. I'm going to read from Psalm 65, verses 1 through 13. And then we'll sing a few songs. Verse 1. Mighty, what mighty praise, O God, belongs to you in Zion. We will fulfill our vows to you, for you answer our prayers. All of us must come to you. Though we are overwhelmed by our sins, you forgive them all. What joy for those who choose to bring near those who live in your holy courts. What festivities await us inside your holy temple. You faithfully answer our prayers with awesome deeds, O God, our Savior. You are the hope of, ev of everyone on earth, even those who sail on distant seas. You formed the mountains by your power and armed yourself with mighty strength. You quieted the raging oceans with their pounding waves and silence the shouting of the nations. Those who live at the ends of the earth stand in awe of your wonders. From where the sun rises to where it sets, you inspire shouts of joy. You take care of the earth and water it, make it rich and fertile. The river of God has plenty of water. It provides a bountiful harvest of grain, for you have ordered it so. You drench the plowed ground with rain, melting the clods and leveling the ridges. You soften the earth with showers and bless its abundant crops. You crown the year with a bountiful harvest. 
Even the hard pathways overflow with abundance. The grasslands of the wilderness become a lush pasture, and the hillsides blossom with joy. The meadows are clothed with flocks of sheep, and the valleys are carpeted with grain. They all shout and sing for joy. that we've lost in battle. And all three of those are signs that, that God's kingdom is not fully here, right? That things are not as they should be. That we live in a fallen and broken world. And so I want us to intercede for that this morning. And we, let's use this song to pray. God, let your kingdom come, your will be done. Where your kingdom is, there will be no death, there will be no tears, there will be no suffering, there will be no war. So as we sing this again, I, I want us to make it our prayer for our nation and for our world. Can we, can we sing this as a prayer and let heaven hear our voices, that God, we are desperate for your kingdom to come, to draw near to us today. Would you pray it with me? Let your kingdom come and your will be done. Hear our prayer. Let your kingdom come and your will be done. 
proclaim today that you alone are king. Jesus, that your name is above every other name. And we gather to worship you, to lift you up. And God, our prayer is that as we do that, as we lift you up, that you would be clearly seen, that we would see your glory, and that everyone around would see you for who you are. And so come, draw near to us. Be revealed in this place. Be revealed in our gathering and in our relationships. Be revealed in our worship. Be revealed in our work. And God, we give you all of the glory and all of the honor and all of the praise. And everyone said, Amen. school we want to send you to class I think most of you already got that memo but everybody else this is Bristow <laughs> well thank you thank you Matt I want to keep singing but we can't well welcome everybody my name is Bristow and I'm one of the pastors here and I just want to extend to every one of you a very warm welcome welcome to the vineyard everybody if you're live or if you're in the live stream we're just so happy that you're here and and uh we're grateful for you um Happy Memorial Day weekend, everybody. Last week, we finished uh, a great sermon series on money, and next week, we're jumping into a new sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount. Best sermon ever. Don't want to miss that one. But today, we have a single sermon, freestanding sermon, and it's called, You Are a Missionary. You Are a Missionary. That's the title. And, and I can see in some of your eyes, you're thinking, I knew I should have played golf this morning instead of coming to church. I really don't want to hear some guy telling me that I need to be a missionary. Um, and I hear that. I totally get that. Uh, but as I have learned to see myself as a missionary, it's, it's changed my life, honestly. And, and I want that for you. I want you to learn to see yourselves as, as missionaries because it'll change, it'll change everything. I think for me, what it did was it reframed the way that I saw my life. It really reframed the way that I saw my job, you know, where I go, Monday through Friday, every day. And, and it reframed that. It reframed the way that I saw my neighborhood and my neighbors, it, it reframed the way that I saw the stuff that I do, recreational activities. It reframed um, all of that. It reframed the way that I saw life changes. Now, for me, life changes cause anxiety. My anxiety shoots up. But it, it changed the way that I see, uh, say, um, job changes or relocation changes or even, even um, relationship changes. Um, but this is the deal. It's not about us. Do you remember the New York Times best-selling uh, book, Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life? Remember that book? I don't know when, 20 years ago or something. Remember the first line? It's such a great first line. Comes right out of the gates. He says, it's not about you. <laughs> I love that. Like, Ugh, really? Yeah. But it isn't, is it? It's not about us. It's about him. Jesus is the king. He's our king. He, in fact, was a missionary. Come to planet Earth. Lived, died for us, rose again. And he's our king. We're not our king. So, so when changes happen, it's always God who is course correcting us. It's always God who's positioning us in our life and in our relationships, and it's always God who's sending us. And that's what the word missionary means. It just means a sent guy, a sent gal. That's, that's, what, that's what it means. Uh, one of the leaders of the vineyard, John Wimber, used to say, 
We are loose change in God's pocket. We, he, can he can spend us any way he wants. And that's just the bottom line. I, I, I love that. Um, so in my life, this is kind of how it worked, right? So I wanted to be a pastor, right? So I went to school and, uh, to be a pastor. And after I, when I finished my studies, God said, I want you to be a teacher. I, I really didn't want to be a teacher. I really, I really, I, I, I just really didn't like teachers. I'm sorry if any of you are teachers. I, I, I never wanted to be a teacher. I, are you kidding me? You know, that I argued, I cajoled, I tried to manipulate God. That never ends well. And I ended up uh, going into teaching. Jesus said, uh, I am the door, Right? He said, I am the door of the sheep. And we're the sheep, right? We're the sheep. And when I walked through the door, when I was obedient to walk through the door, everything changed. I saw that it didn't matter if I was a teacher or a pastor or whatever. That, that, that actually what I was was a missionary to the relationships that I had, that God had given me. It just reframes everything. And so for 15 years, um, I was a missionary to the public schools. And I served as a missionary in the public schools in California and in Massachusetts and in Texas and then here at PSD as I helped plant churches. But I, that's what I was. I was a missionary. And man, have I got some great stories. I wish I had time for some of those great stories. But this is the deal. The outcome of that Seeing myself, learning to see myself as a missionary was that I began to thrive like I'd never thrived before. And I want that for you. Of, of all the things that I'd want for you, just personally, I, I want that for you to thrive. And so uh, the title of this message is You Are a Missionary. Let's pray. Come Holy Spirit. Come and rest on us. Come form us. We're clay in your hand. Teach us. May we lean forward into your teaching. And Lord, would you visit us? And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so let's, let's dive in. Let's dive in. Um, the word mis missionary comes from the Latin word missio, which simply means Sent, just sent a person. So you are personally sent by Jesus. And we collectively, as the Vineyard of the Rockies, are sent. And we, as part of the church universal, are a sent people. And, and this is the implication that every one of us is a missionary. Every one of us is a missionary. And that idea is rooted in one of the most important verses in the whole Bible. We call it, it even has a name, it's so important. It's called the Great Commission. It's at the end of Matthew. And, and so the risen Jesus says this. He says, therefore, go, make disciples of all nations. Those three things I want to unpack. And, uh, and so the first thing, the first thing that a missionary does is go. So we're all a missionary. We go. Time out. Time out. I'm going to take a sermon time out right now. And we need, we need to huddle, okay? We need to huddle. You and the live stream too. We need to huddle for just a minute. Anytime we hear that we're all missionaries and we all have to go, you know, I, the, uh, the anxiety shoots to the ceiling, doesn't it? Any, any of you a little bit, you know, a little uncomfortable with this? Okay, really, dude, are you, where's Jeff when we need him, you know? Uh, <laughs> let me tell it to you straight, though. The vast, vast, vast majority of us, God is not calling us to uproot our family and move to a foreign country that we hate, right? <laughs> we, we don't want to be there. 
And I say that as someone who was a missionary in the Middle East for 11 years. Jamie and I and little Owen then moved to the Middle East. And so we, we, we did that. But, but that's not what God is calling us to do. And I, for, the, for, the, for most of us, and, and uh, um, I know that some of us, you know, because that's always that threat, right? It's kind of like a threat, is always out there. You know, if I really surrendered my life to Christ, I mean, really gave him everything, God might call me to some, like, place that I don't want to go. You know what? That's a lie from the pit of hell. That's, that's not true at all. That's, don't listen to the lies anymore. You know, if you're really called to do that, to, to uproot and move to some place, you can't wait to get there. It's just a different deal. The vast, vast majority of us are, are called here. Remember, the word missionary means sent. When Jesus says go, when he's telling us go in the Great Commission, he's saying go into the relationships in which I've already positioned you at your job, in your neighborhood, in your recreational activities, um, wherever. That's where we go. Um, and that's how we join God's mission. You know, our, our, uh, our kind of our, our church motto, our mission statement is out in the foyer, right? In those white letters. What does it say? Joining. Joining God's mission, transforming all things. So what do we do? We lean into the relationships that he's already positioned us in. Isn't that, isn't that freeing? What, what does it look like um, in, in real life? You know what? Every one of you could come up these stairs and, and, and give a story about actually how you were a missionary. You just haven't seen yourself as that. But I'll, I'll just use one example from my life. When we, uh, Jamie and the kids and I moved back from the Middle East, we needed to buy a house. So we had this relationship with the sellers of the house we were interested in. It was a for sale by owner deal. And so we had to have a relationship with them. And he was kind of a prickly uh, CSU professor, you know, very secular very secular. His wife was very secular. She was a social worker, you know, and we were just fresh off the mission field, you know. In their minds, we were like, you know, these people that literally moved to a different country so we could change all their religion and then have them join our hate group called the church. <laughs> That's a little strong, but it wasn't too far off the bark, right? So it's kind of oil and water, and they're, they're, they're walking us through this. It's kind of a, probably a stretch for them just to even show us the house, you know? Uh, I think maybe they thought the kids were cute or something. But So we're going through the house, and after about you know, 15 minutes, despite her best effort, she kind of started to like us. <laughs> and so she pulls me off to the side into the kitchen. She said, you're not like those other Christians, are you? <laughs> By which she meant, you're not like the hate-filled stereotypes of Christians that I read about in my media, right? That's what she, that's what she was saying. Um, uh, clearly, she'd never met a Christian before. I don't know any people like that. In the, uh, in the church, but she had never met a, a, a Christian before. And this is a thing that was kind of funny. We didn't say anything. I mean, we didn't, you know, we were, we were just looking at the house, you know. We didn't do anything. All we did was step into the relationship into which we'd already been positioned by God, no idea on our part. We just stepped into it, and the kingdom of God moved forward and created a friendship with them, and they're friends to this day. Now, they're, they're not the kind of friends that we could invite to church. They, they wouldn't darken the door of a church, but they might come to Alpha. And I'll tell you a little bit about Alpha uh, in, in a second. Um, but this is what I want to say to you, that every one of you has been positioned by God in, in relationships. Are you a golfer? Then go to the golf course and join what God's already doing at the golf course. Are you a reader? Then go to the book club and join what God's already doing in the book club. Um, are, you, uh, are your kids in sports? Then go to the ball field and join what God's already doing with the parents and, and with the kids, the, the, the players. I, me, I like, to, I like to visit ethnic restaurants. I like to visit ethnic restaurants too much. Uh, but that's another issue, and I don't want to talk about it right now. Um, 
but uh, so so I went to uh, uh, I'd always uh, I went to a Thai restaurant and uh, and I'd always go and she said why do you always come to the restaurant at the same time I said well I go to the Vineyard Church and that's when it ends she said the Vineyard Church she said I'm a Buddhist but if I was a Christian I'd come to the Vineyard Church she was just asking to be asked at the church right <laughs> another one talking to another owner of a restaurant she she says. Do you know any good shamans? She knew I was a pastor. Do you know any good shamans? I said, you know, I really don't. Not off the top of my head. But you should come to Alpha. She said, really? What's Alpha? She said, I said, well, it's a series of interactive sessions about life and meaning and faith. And, you, and, and, and we have a meal. We show a 20-minute a, a video clip. And then we have a nice meal at the uh, Welsh Rabbit rest, restaurant in Old Town and maybe a glass of wine. And then after that, we discuss it with our friends at the table. She said, okay. You know, Alpha was about halfway through. I'd love to come. She brought a friend. She loved it. She said, man, I want to have Alpha in my restaurant. <laughs> we got to get her saved first. But after we do that, um, I think we're good to go with that. But this is the question. What is it that you do? What is it that you do? Do what you do. And step into those relationships there. And lean into those relationships. Because God is at work. And, and this is, these are not in my notes, but a friend encouraged me to say that. You know, in the church, sharing Christ is dropping out of the church culture. I mean, the Baptists used to go every Every, every Wednesday night, right, they'd knock on doors. My father-in-law, that's what he used to do. Every, you know, with all the Baptists. But we're not doing that as much. And you know what? Right at the point where this, we have this rapidly secularizing culture, we're, we're slowing down and sharing our faith. And that, the, God's heart's breaking for that. And, and so um, um, I just want to encourage you, go. Lean into the relationships that he's already positioned you in. That's what go means. So if the first thing that Jesus said is to go, the second thing that Jesus said is to make disciples. What does that mean? Does that mean being a student? It's like going to you know, school? Or, or what did the risen Christ mean by disciples? Well, Jesus uh, got his idea from, from his Hebrew culture. In, in, in Hebrew culture in Jesus' day, um, children would go to what's called Beit Safar. And at Beit Safar, they would memorize the first five books of the Bible, the Talmud, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Can you imagine? <laughs> it'd be, it was like me. It'd be like, okay, don't tell me. Uh, in the beginning, what's the next bit? God. God. What's, you know, can you imagine? But that's what they did. At the age of 10, most of those children would go back to their families. But the best of those, the gifted of those, would go on to Beit Talmud, where they would memorize the rest of the Bible. Genesis through Malachi, right? At about the age of 14, the vast, vast majority of those would go back to their family trades, fishing, shepherding, uh, you know, whatever, carpentry. But the best of the best would go on um, uh, to bait Midrash, in which they would apply to be a disciple with a rabbi. Most of those didn't get accepted, but mo- every once in a while, a rabbi guy, you know what? I think this kid has it. I think this kid can be who I am, do what I do, and teach what I teach. And then the rabbi would say, come, follow me. At that point, the young disciple would leave his village and family and friends and go to live with the rabbi and then follow the rabbi from synagogue to synagogue as that rabbi preached. And they had a saying that people would kind of, it's kind of a blessing, where they would bless the, ra- the, the young disciple as they saw them following the rabbi. May you be covered with the dust of your rabbi, by which they meant May you so closely follow your rabbi in every way. May you so closely imitate your rabbi in every way that as you follow the rabbi through the dusty hot roads of Palestine, may may the dust of his sandals fly up and cover you. 
And, and that's what Jesus meant by disciple. <laughs> pretty, pretty full on, right? <laughs> it's pretty intense. Uh, took everything that they had. But, but this, is, this is what I love. Jesus did it a little differently than that. He chose the guys that didn't make the cut. They never made it to Beit Midrash. They probably didn't make it to Beit Talmud, you know. They were guys uh, who Jesus could tell had the heart. God looks at the heart. And uh, they, were, they were the non-performers. They were the non-achievers. They were the everybodies. Jesus chooses the everybodies. And that's why, that's why I'm a disciple. And that's why you're, you're disciples. John Wimber, again, used to say, when you go to the mall or you go wherever people are, look for the people with tilted heads. He said, they're like stalks of wheat whose heads are so ripe, so, re so, so full of wheat that when the wind blows, their heads are tilted. He said, those people are ripe for harvest. Isn't that beautiful? Those are the people we look for. Those are the people who are ripe for harvest. Not the super achievers. Not, not the gifted. The everybody's. So when we find them, what can we do? Well, this is kind of a no-brainer to me. We invite them to church. When we see people who, who, who we can disciple, we, we, we want to bring them to church. You know what? Summertime is a great time to bring people to church because more than any other season, people are looking for new churches. And so they're coming. And so they're going to be comfortable here. It's a great time to do that. And so I want to just extend you a personal invitation, kind of a challenge, that every one of you would bring one person to church this summer. You got to the end of August. <laughs> but you've already been put into a, a network of relationships. And you know what? That's not a weird thing, especially our church. This is a great place to come. So, so think about that. Think about who you might be able to um, bring to church. And then, and then in the fall, you can invite them to Alpha. <laughs> Shameless plug, I do Alpha. So I just had to throw that in. I couldn't help myself. Okay, so the first thing we do is go. Second thing we do is make disciples. Third thing we do is bring, uh, go to the nations. What does nations mean? Well, the, Jesus, Jesus gave the sermon, uh, the sermon on the Mount. That's next week. Gave uh, the Great Commission in Hebrew. The Hebrew word for nations is goyim. If you have a, a Hebrew uh, Jewish background, you might know the Yiddish goy. You know, it's like everybody else. What Jesus meant was, what goyim meant was, what nations meant was, Anybody who doesn't have a covenant relationship with Yahweh. That means for us, anybody that doesn't know Jesus. That's what nations means. We think of the word nations geopolitically, but that's not what it means in the text. Right? It doesn't mean a place with a border. You know, it's got a border and it's got people in the middle. <laughs> it means anybody who doesn't know Jesus. So we go to people who don't know Jesus. So if you are talking to your next door neighbor and you're inviting him to the vineyard, you've just gone to the nations if that person doesn't know Jesus. If you're on the golf course and you, you, you witness to someone, you've just gone to the nations. If you volunteer at the food bank, you've just gone to the nations. The bottom line is you don't have to go anywhere to preach to the nations. God's already positioned you. Don't mess it up. <laughs> Lean into those relationships. Some of you may be thinking, yeah, but what about the 41% of the population of the world who is deemed unreached? The vast majority of those live in what's missiologists called the the, the 1040 window, it, 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 it's 
starts in where Morocco is on the west coast of North Africa and it wraps around the earth, uh, there it is, uh, to, you know, the Philippines and, and, and Japan. What about those people? Shouldn't we go to those people? Absolutely, if God's calling you to do that. But let me tell you something. Having done that, I think the most, most, most effective way that, that we can be a missionary is go befriend a student at CSU who comes from a foreign country. That's, that's the most effective way for most of us to reach those people. Let me tell you a story. Um, Abdullah Hawatma comes from the, the village of Gadara, which is where Jesus, remember, Jesus cast the demons into the pig and they went, they went over the cliff, remember that? That's the town he was from. Abdullah, uh, when he was in high school, he won a uh, scholarship to a university in America where he was going to study engineering. He comes to America, he studies, and while he's studying, he becomes a born-again Christian, right? He comes from this Muslim tribe, and in, in, it's just south of the Golan Heights. You can see the Sea of Galilee in northern, the country of Jordan, northern Jordan, and, uh, and he, go, he, he finishes his studies. He goes back to his Muslim tribe as a born-again Christian. How does that work? This is just like God, though. This is so amazing to me. God positions us. Go where God positions, positions us. God already has people positioned to reach people. So Abdullah's dad is the sheikh of a tribe. He's the leader of the tribe. That's what sheikh means. You're the leader, leader of a tribe. So he's the leader of his Muslim tribe. But how succession works over there is when the sheikh dies, his son sort of becomes the new sheikh. So Abdullah Hawatma's dad dies. Abdullah becomes the new sheikh, the new leader of a large Muslim tribe in Jordan as a born-again believer. He goes, ding, light bulb goes off. I am a missionary. I've been sent to my Muslim tribe. He has all kinds of power and influence. And he sees his Muslim tribe as his mission field. And he has been a missionary to his tribe to this day. God's way ahead of us, you know. <laughs> so why would we go try to be, try to, you know, you get my point. God's way ahead of us. He positions us. I just love that story, um, and I just had to share it. Okay, so let's wrap this thing up. <clears throat> I, I've already made a couple of asks. I'm going to make one more ask, and that is that you would consider joining me in in seeing yourselves as a missionary to northern Colorado. And a way that you can do that is you can bring someone to church. So I, I, I just want to encourage you, as we wrap things up, that you would go into those relationships in which you've already been positioned, that you would make disciples with those he gives you, and that you go to all the nations, those who don't know Jesus. Um, I would love, love, love to, to meet with you. If you'd like to have a coffee with me or a meal, you can, you can contact me. I think the contact information, there's my email, phone number, that's a church phone, phone number. I'd love, to, I'd love to, to meet with you. And we could talk about how, how you can be a missionary in northern Colorado. I'd love to get together. So I just wanted to, to, to throw that out to you. And it's also on the weekly. So, um, uh, so now at this point, we, we kind of pivot, and we pivot into a re time of reflection. And I love this. This is your time. It's been busy, hasn't it, with graduation? It's just been crazy. But, but this is your time. We're going to lower the lights, and the, and the band is going to uh, come up and play. But this is your time to reflect on the message, but also to, to, to hear God with what he's asking of you, what he's saying to you. And, and if you're not sure what to, to think about, maybe, maybe pray about, Lord, who could I, who could I invite? What, what name are you highlighting for me? Um, so, so um, Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the Great Commission, and we pray that you would, uh, you would commission us. You have commissioned us. 
you would continue to commission us to lean into those relationships in which you've placed us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'll, I'll be back up uh, in a couple of minutes. our response time and uh, the main thing we do now is we sing with everything in us we sing to him uh, you can also give by going to one of the boxes at the back of the room uh, you can come and get communion and celebrate communion um, you can get prayer this is your time I just encourage you uh, to go get what you need. So we've got a great prayer team back there. They're, they've got lanyards on back over here. You can get prayer from them. But um, so let's worship. Let's worship the King.
Some of you have family. Those relationships here visiting, those relationships are, are precious to the Lord. And he wants to bless us. So bless you as you go into the highways and byways of life this weekend, following him into those relationships that he's already positioned you in. So thanks for coming, everybody. Bless you guys. We'll see you next week. Come take